Our scripture reading for today is found in the book of John, chapter 4, verses 5 to 10. I will be reading from the New King James Version, and I read, So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus said, Therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is that you, being a Jew, as a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus said, answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. May we all be blessed from the reading of his words. Alhamdulillah, praise the Lord. In the light of His Word, what a glory. 
Are you ready to quit your job in the next 12? Good morning and happy Sabbath Church family. I praise God that all of us are safe and sound, ready to worship the Lord in His spirit and in truth. Obviously today is the Lord's day. And this Sabbath, we will be studying about this important ministry, Adventist Muslim Relations. The view of Christianity with Muslims often see is that of polytheists, drinkers, pork eaters, and other forbidden things, and immodest. The term Muslim, by definition, is someone who totally surrenders his life to God. And for them, they do not often see that among Christians. If an Adventist Christian identifies himself or herself to a Muslim as one who tries to live a total submission to God, this provides one small stepping stone toward friendship. And as the friendship grows, and as the Muslim learns that Adventist shares many lifestyle ideas with Islam, and we don't worship idols, that will even add more stepping stones to be built. The purpose of Adventist Muslim relation is to diminish the negative attitude and myths on both sides and promote greater respect and understanding. At first Filipino Canadian Seventh-day Adventist Church, we've been in good terms to some members of the Muslim community. As a matter of fact, we've been invited to their major events, like cultural events where we were able to share our cultural talents. If you can remember, they were able to join us in a church worship events, and they were able to break their fast in a very own church basement. Personally, I was blessed to see the seven churches of the Book of Revelation in Turkey because of our Muslim brothers and sisters. Until now, they're still inviting us to join their major events. Today, we will listen to one of the testimonies of one of our brethren who've been to a Muslim country. 
also we will be able to see the report of the Adventist World Radio how the Muslim ministry is doing in that part of the world and I just want to take this opportunity to thank Pastor Hazel as God's appointed messenger today he is the director of personal ministry and coordinator of Adventist Muslim Relation in Ontario Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Is there such thing as unique way of reaching out to our Muslim brothers and sisters? Let's pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit we will be part of this ministry. God bless us all. Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. Marhaba. That's the greeting in Arabic word. I had a privilege of working with Muslim people in the Middle East. When I was working with the Benghazi Adventist Hospital in Libya as a missionary, one of our all of our patients, or 99% of them, are Muslims. None of them have heard about our religion until they come to our hospital for treatment. And beside our hospital is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We worship on Sabbath and they worship on Fridays. One of the contacts we have with them was setting up a five-day plan to stop smoking seminar. This has been a successful program, especially that the majority of them smoke. I also started a branch Sabbath school among the young people in the community and a vi vacation Bible school during summers. Even the mothers love to sing the children's song. This is the first time they have heard of Jesus. It will be wonderful again to connect with the Muslim community and share and love and care for them. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Our stewardship offering reading for this week is entitled A Birth Offering. Herbert Burger was pastoring a district in Canoas, Brazil when Beth, his wife, became pregnant. During the third month of pregnancy, the couple was visited by a pastor of their conference who read to them some texts from their book, Child Guidance by Ellen G. White. Among other things, he suggested that they bring a thank offering when dedicate the child's month later. And so they prepared an envelope with an offering for the occasion. But became very challenging besides suffering from the severe anemia during her seventh month of pregnancy. The upper part of Beth's uterine bag broke and the uh, amniotic amnio, amnio, fluid poured out. She rushed to the hospital and was told to get total rest and, uh, until the baby's birth. But then she got an infection when continued, which continued to worsen to the point where the physicians told her that if he wouldn't be aware the peculiarity of her case. The exams taken alone would suggest Terminal leukemia. Beth's situation was very risky and with sadness. She and Herbert considered what to do with the offering of the envelope if their baby did not survive. The couple spent much time in prayer. The pastors attending in ministerial councils at the time also joined them in prayer, stopping their meeting to pray together a full hour on for them. Later, at that the same day, Beth had additional tests which showed that her infections was no longer growing. So the doctor scheduled and per performed a cesarean section. Herbert uh, and Beth known that the birth of their sons William on March 12, 2005 was a miracle 
mother was a miracle. Mother and baby stayed in the hospital for two weeks until Beth's infections cleared up. While the while there, the same pastor visited Beth again and assured that an angels of God had been caring for William since his birth. After Beth, after Beth was discharged and went home, she and Herbert added to the envelope five times more than the original amount, concluding that the sum, however large, could represent their gratitude to the Lord. In front of the church member, the couple not only dedicated Williams to God, but with tears in their eyes, they placed the envelope into the baskets held by deacons. Our appeal this morning, it says that let, let's thank God now and recognize His wonderful working with our offering. God bless us. Let us pray, brothers and sisters. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege of meeting together through online. Thank you, Father, O oh Lord, for the protection from the COVID virus that is going around. We are so thankful for providing our needs even in the midst of this pandemic crisis. We also thank you for the joy of being saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for the joy of forgiveness for our sins. And thank you, Lord, for the unconditional love for each one of us. Today, as we worship together, may the Holy Spirit live in every heart that is online today. We pray that you open our hearts and our minds so that we can understand the preaching of our brother, Dr. Hazelwood. In a special way, we pray that you bless him with the strength and the knowledge as he shared the message for us today. Today also, we would like to ask a blessing for those who are sick among us. In a special way, we pray for the people that has been listed in the bulletin, the 38 people who has been sick. May you grant them the healing, O Lord as you promised, that if we pray for them, you will heal them. And then we also pray for our brothers, uh, the Abel family, the Abok family, and the Akuhido family. May you give them the strength, provide for their needs, whatever their needs, Lord, may you provide for them. We also pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling with their job and finances. May you provide them with the wisdom so that they can find a job. We also pray for our brothers and sisters who are struggling with their family relationship. We ask that you mend our broken hearts. Help us to forgive those who hurt us also. In a special way, we pray for our Muslim brothers and our Jewish brothers. We pray for them that you will save them in the name of Jesus. And Lord, help us to to reach out to them, to have the burden for this group of people in order for them to, to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Finally, help us to be like Jesus in our words and in our action. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hello, boys and girls. Happy Sabbath. I am so happy to be with you today. It's been a long time since we didn't get to worship with you. You know why? Because we were in the Philippines. You see, when, we were, when you were locked down here, we were locked down there too. Just like here, a lot of us had to stay home. Remember, you didn't get to go to school since March? The children over there didn't go to school too. Not only that, some of their parents didn't get to go back to their work. They lost their jobs. So after a while, there's one word that became so popular in the Philippines at that time. You want to know what it is? The word is Ayuda. Can you say that? Ayuda. Very good. Ayuda means help. A lot of people were waiting for Ayuda because the money that he had before the lockdown were now finished. They don't have anything to buy food and they still couldn't go back to work. So they just wait for Ayuda from the government so they have something to eat. But most of the time, 
there were not enough. Do you know that in the Bible, Jesus gave a lot of ayuda to so many people. He helped the blind to see, he helped the lame to walk, he helped the sick get back to health. He helped the brokenhearted be comforted and be whole again. He helped the uh, mute to talk again. He helped the possessed be free from the demons. He gave a lot of ayuda to so many people. In Mark chapter 6 and 8, we can find two particular stories where Jesus gave ayuda to so many people, to thousands of people actually. In Mark 6, Jesus and his disciples were near the Sea of Galilee and there were too many Jews gathered to listen. The disciples wanted to send them away because it was already late in the day. But Jesus refused to send them away hungry. So he asked the disciples to go and see how many bread they have. The disciples found... Let's see how many they find. The disciples found one, two, three, four, five bread and two fish. I don't know if it's tinapa or uh, just fried galunggong, I don't know. But they find five bread and two fish. The story tells us that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and gave it to the people and they were all satisfied you know how many you know how many people were fed that day there were 5000 men plus the women plus the children that were not included in the count. After all the people finished, the, uh, finished their eating, there were 12 kofinos or baskets filled with leftover bread and fish. Wow, that was amazing. They must be thinking about that miracle while they were chewing their food. And then shortly after that, in Mark chapter eight, Jesus and his disciples were around the Decapolis this time, the other side of the lake, where Jesus fed the 5,000. So they went over to the other side, and that's where Jesus were, and the disciples were. So this time, the Gentile people were gathered, listening to Jesus for three days already. Wow! they must be very interested in what Jesus was going to tell them or was telling them. The disciples wanted to send them home now, but Jesus knew that without food, they would faint along the way home. So Jesus asked how many bread they have. This time, the disciples found, let's count. One, two, three, four five six seven bread and some fish yeah they found seven bread and some fish and Jesus what did Jesus do Jesus took the bread he blessed it he broke it and gave it to the people and again they were all satisfied you know how many were fed this time there were there were four thousand men plus the women and plus the children so it's more than just four thousand after all the people finished eating there were seven seven spirits means in greek large baskets that were filled with leftover food wow so when jesus gave um this uh, ayuda by feeding thousands of people both in the land of the jews and the land of the gentiles it wasn't just cool those were great great miracles all right that's so great miracles we have for the Jews, we have for the Gentiles, wow! But why are we being told about these two miracles? Isn't one story of miraculous feeding enough? 
Before I tell you why, there's one important thing that we have to learn first. Let's read from Mark 14, 22. And it says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. So here, we learn that the bread that Jesus was sharing to thousands of people represents himself. He said, take it, this is my body. Jesus is the bread. Jesus is the Ayuda. He is the help. So boys and girls, I want you to remember three things from this miracle or from this story. Number one, Jesus has enough bread for everyone. He has enough bread for the Jews. He has enough bread for the Gentiles. He has enough bread for the believers and for the non-believers. He has enough bread for people who worship this way, people who worship that way, people who worship this way, or people who worship this way. Jesus has enough bread for everyone. You see, even in the Philippines, he has enough bread for the children over there and other side of the world. You see, when we were in the Philippines, we saw how God provided bread for our neighbors over there. He gave, uh, he impressed to some people that he wanted to give uh, a yuda to some people over there in our neighborhood. And so we were so blessed to see how uh, God worked in there by giving food packs to our neighbors. So I'm sure that whether you are here, here in Canada or in the Philippines or in other parts of the world, God has enough bread for everyone. So Jesus, and number two, Jesus is the bread that satisfies. When we take Jesus in our life, the bread of life, we will be satisfied. He is the only ayuda or help we need. Number three, I'd like us to remember that Jesus blessed others through us. See, Jesus wants us to have to share our bread. When Jesus blesses us, he wants us that we bless others by sharing with them so they too can be satisfied. We shouldn't be like the disciples who cannot believe that Jesus would actually go to the other side, reach out to the outsiders of the Jewish territory, to the unbelievers to offer them the good news and feed them too. Jesus wanted them or the disciples to understand that his love his ayuda, his bread is for everyone, not just for the Jews. So you see, when Jesus blesses us, the blessing is not just for us. He blesses us so that we can bless others through us, okay? So boys and girls, I hope that when we have a chance, let's not keep Jesus the bread of life just to ourselves. Let us share him with others because everybody needs the bread. Everybody needs the bread that satisfies. Everybody needs Jesus and he is enough for everybody. God bless. My uncle had tried to stone me to death. And now my cousins were here to finish the job. Find out how God is using Adventist World Radio to reach the Muslim community and other difficult to reach areas with the gospel message. Hi, I'm Cami Utman and this is AWR 360. Adventist World Radio is broadcasting to the most remote locations of the world in more than 130 different languages. We've been doing this for the past, well, almost 50 years now, but I've never seen anything like this before. From baptizing rebels and assassins, almost daily we receive news of amazing miracles taking place all around this old ball of mud. Weeds and story right here in Nazareth is an example that especially touched my heart. 
Being born Muslim, Wiesen was taught to hate Christianity. So when his sister decided to become a Christian, he was sent by his family to kill her. But because of a miraculous dream from God, he decided to begin studying the Bible. He soon returned to Nazareth to share his new belief with his family. And his uncle, upon hearing this, became very angry and ordered his stoning. This happened over and over until finally his brother stepped in. Then his father advised Wiesem to flee the country. Years later, after his father and uncle died, Wiesem's mother invited him to return. He immediately saw an opportunity to share Jesus in Nazareth. So he decided to set up a center of influence where he used the Bible to teach English to his fellow people. We also gave Wiesem AWR God Pods, which he distributed among his community. Recently though, things took a turn for the worse, as the sons of his dead uncle found out what Wiesem was doing. They too had participated in his stoning many years before, and now rallied a mob and went to Wiesem's house to attack him. Wiesem's wife, Audrey, heard the commotion downstairs and rushed out to see what was happening. She knew right away that Wiesem was in serious trouble and fell on her knees and began to pray. Wiesem's brothers rushed to protect him when he was hit with a metal rod, but then his own cousin pulled out his knife and stabbed Wiesem. But to his astonishment, the knife bent, leaving him unharmed. Wiesem's brother then picked up the bent knife and said, Try again to kill the man of God. As the mob retreated, they threatened, You will not know where or when, but we will kill you. Several months later, Wiesem received a shocking phone call that these same two cousins had been killed while riding their motorcycle. It just reminds me that if God is for us, who can be against us? This miraculous event agitated the Muslim community so much that Wiesem knew it was the perfect time to use AWR's cell phone evangelism. He immediately sought out someone to translate the sermons into Arabic. He found a man named Jamil who readily agreed to help. Jamil worked for days, sometimes late into the night, translating the Bible-based sermons. As he read, he was so greatly moved by the presentations that he felt compelled to share them with one of his friends from the Baptist Church. She was so amazed by the sermons that she shared them with her pastor, who was also impressed by what he read. He then sought out Wiesem to preach at his church. Wiesem presented at the Baptist Church, sharing Bible prophecy, our health message, and Ellen White's writings. Their hearts were so convicted that the pastor and almost his whole congregation made the decision to be baptized into the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And on a beautiful Sabbath day, we held a church service at the Jordan River. Then one by one, they entered into the water. Wiesem had the joy of baptizing these precious souls with Elder Dwayne McKee. God is calling all who are willing to proclaim his last day message. Adventist World Radio not only broadcasts into the Muslim countries in their own languages, but we are working with people like Wiesem, helping to share the gospel message in countries that still need to hear the wonderful story of Jesus. Thank you for supporting AWR. Jesus is coming soon, and he invites you and me to be a part of this great movement that will light the earth with a knowledge of his truth. From broadcast to baptism, this is AWR 360.
consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. today to share with you a word from the gospel of John chapter 4 
Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be with you and uh, to share in your ministry at your church. And so our scripture reading would focus on John chapter 4, verses 5 to 10. If you have your Bibles in whatever form, I would share with you what the Bible says. It says in John chapter 4, verses 5 to 10. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. This is a familiar story to most of us. But allow me to recap it just a bit. Uh, according to the story, Jesus was on his way to Galilee and felt like he should go through Samaria. When he got to a town called Sica, the disciples went to find food. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Jesus sits at Jacob's well and strikes up a conversation with a Samaritan woman. Now, in those times, we need to be reminded that this was not a good deal to most people. Uh, first of all, she was a woman. The prevailing attitude of Jewish men was that it was almost better to be a dog than a woman. That was the attitude of the times. Next, and probably more important, she was a Samaritan. Samaritans were half-breed Jews who intermarried with the people of the re region who were there by the king of Assyria during the exile of Israel. Now, Jews hated Samaritans, and the feeling was mutual. Uh, vice versa, Samaritans hated the Jews also. And now, as we look at the story, uh, we recognize that not only was this woman, she a woman, uh, she was also a Samaritan, but there's a third dimension. She's a sinner. Three strikes, you're out, right? Well, not with Jesus, and hopefully not with us either. Uh, today, I want to show us how we can reach out to those people who are outside our normal uh, circles of influence, our normal circles of people that we relate to. And I want to do that by showing you the example of Jesus as recorded in John chapter 4. And there are a couple of points I want you to note from uh, this passage of John 4, 5 onward. Uh, I, I want you to note that very carefully. Number one, we need to learn to set aside our prejudices. Uh, these are times where prejudices have, have been creating a lot of stir and disturbances in communities where people have become uh, more assertive about who they are. Uh, I, I would be so bold to say that most of us, if not all of us, operate under certain prejudices, uh, though some less than others. Jesus was under no such restraint. You see, Jesus was a Jew, but that didn't stop him from ministering to many different people, including a centurion from the hated Roman army. And here we see him talking in John chapter 4 with a Samaritan woman. Follow along as we paint this picture. I urge you to remember the principles that will come as a result of us looking at that passage. And as we consider the fact that we should learn to set aside our prejudices, 
I want you to see three principles that would help us in shedding those prejudices. I want you, one, to consider that it's not the color of the skin, but the color of the blood. It's not so much, my friends, about your gender or your image. We are all made in the image of God, regardless of our sex or age or current lifestyle or religion, regardless of where in the world we have come from. We have all been made in the image of God. Jesus shed his blood. And, I, I, and, and he shed it for every one of us, I believe, because I can't find anything in Scripture that says he shed his blood only for seven-day Adventists. Uh, I, I can't find anything in Scripture that says he shed his blood for, for, for Israel only or for, or for or people of color or for, for people who are white. Uh, he shed his blood for all. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Last time I checked, my friends, that included all of us, including the Samaritans. Uh, and when I check my blood, when I bleed, it's the same color red that Jesus bled. So he shed his blood red for all of us, regardless of whether we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, Samaritans, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, whoever we are, Jesus shed his blood. So we got to consider that. We, we got to consider that it's not the color of the skin, but the color of the blood. Consider the root issue of salvation as you consider uh, getting rid of your prejudices. Uh, people of all races and lifestyles need Jesus. Let me say that again. People of all races and lifestyles need Jesus. Uh, they are not exempt. The issue is not where they have come from or how they dress or how we dress for that matter. No, uh, they might look good and smell good and even go to church. But if they don't trust in Jesus Christ as their savior from sin, then there is a problem. It was no different for the Samaritans, and it's no different for us today. So we are challenged to understand the issue of salvation is not just for one group of people. It's for everyone. We have a responsibility as we shed our prejudices, as we put them down. We need to reach out to work with people of every kind, creed, race, wherever they have come from. Consider that. That tells me that I should move on to consider where you have come from. I don't really necessarily mean ethnicity, but that can play a part. Immigrants need the love of God too. Now, we need to be reminded that unless we are full-blooded native Canadians, we have descended from immigrants. But what I really meant when I spoke uh, to the point of consider where you have come from, what I really meant is that we all need to remember that before we came to Christ, we were enemies of God. Enemies of God? Yes, enemies of God. The Bible says that until we became children of God, we were objects of his wrath, yet he looked at these objects of wrath and said they were worth savings. Friends, Samaritans are worth saving too. Muslims are worth saving too. Hindus are worth saving too. Uh, other Christians who don't know, who call themselves Christian but don't know Jesus are worth saving too. So set aside your prejudices uh, and, and reach out to people that don't look like you, that don't speak like you, that don't dress like you, and share the love of Jesus with them. So that was number one, set aside your prejudices. Number two, uh, we need to be able to speak the truth in love. Watch what verse 13 to 18 of of John chapter 4 says, uh, as we look at it, uh, we would see that if Jesus was following certain models of evangelism, 
that some of us embrace today, he wouldn't have brought up the woman's sin. He would have just told her, well, all you got to do is love Jesus and everything would be all right. Mm -hmm. No need to turn from her sin. No need to die to her own desires and follow Christ. It's easy for us to want to avoid touchy subjects, my friends. Unfortunately, uh, we need to get outside our comfort zones. Uh, uh, scripture speaks rather specifically about sin and its consequences. And people need to know that sin grieves God and that the penalty for sin is death. Jesus didn't hold back when he spoke with the uh, Samaritan woman. Jesus spoke to her. He had that conversation with the Samaritan woman, but he had it uh, with an attitude of love for her. He told the woman that he knew of her sin and he didn't apologize for it. Here, my dear brothers and sisters, are some tips for telling the truth in love. First, don't apologize for the truth. Many people, including Seventh-day Adventists, try to make us feel like we need to apologize for sharing Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you something, my friends. My Muslim friends uh, are not apologizing for telling us about their uh, religious system. My, my, the Mormons are not apologizing uh, to share what they believe in. The Jehovah Witnesses are not apologizing to share what they believe in. So why should I be apologizing to witness about the Jesus I know and the Jesus I love? We've got to be able to do it in love as we share with them. We have nothing to apologize when sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God for salvation of everyone who believes. Uh, if anything we need to apologize for is not bringing the gospel to these people sooner. Yeah, you're very quiet on me now. If the Bible is right, friends, and it is, then we have the news that people need to avoid sin and hell and enjoy forgiveness and a full life here on earth and eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven. Friends, don't apologize for sharing the good news. Just be mindful that we share that good news with an attitude of love to those we are coming into contact with. As we share the truth, don't look down on others who are not of your faith thinking that you are better than they. Look at how the disciples uh, dealt when they came back in verse 27 of John chapter 4. Look at how the, 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 uh, their attitude was uh, with Jesus. Just uh, The Bible says just then his disciples returned. As, in other words, as Jesus was having that conversation with the Samaritan woman, the disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked her, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her, Jesus? The implication here is that they wanted to ask that, but didn't. You can almost imagine what they were thinking. Why were you talking to her, Jesus? Don't you remember that she is a woman? Worse than that, Jesus, she is a Samaritan woman. If they had known about her home life, they would have gone ballistic in telling Jesus about, about what he was doing. But let me say this as nicely as I can to all of us today. We are no better than anyone else. We might be better off because of our relationship with Christ, but we are no better. Thank God for the saving grace of Jesus Christ that has taken us from where we are, snatched us from the grasp of the enemy and cleaned us up and set us straight and, and put our feet on solid ground and given us the reason to, to be looking forward to a better day when Jesus will come to take us home. Think of that when dealing with the Samaritans. Think of that when you have to deal with your friends who are not of your uh, faith. Uh, think of that when you are reaching out to your Muslim friends. That we really know better except 
for the blood of Jesus Christ. So let's not look down on anyone. Let's have the right attitude of, of, of dealing with them in love. So set aside your prejudices uh, and speak the truth in love. Number three, be available and ready. The point here is that there are plenty of opportunities to tell someone about salvation and see people come to Christ. There are people, Samaritans, right outside the doors of your church, right outside your home. They're right out there now who are ready to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. But someone needs to tell them. I hope that you will go out and try to find some of them and tell them the good news that Jesus loves them. In this difficult time of, of coronavirus, uh, this difficult time of COVID-19, when some people are losing hope and, and don't have the peace that they have and try to find a purpose for their life because things are not going the way they, it should go. We, we have reason to tell them of the love of Jesus Christ, of a, of a Christ who came in the midst of a crisis and, and died and, and rose again and is back in heaven and interceding and he's coming back one day according to the, the gospel of John, he's going to return and uh, when he comes back, he's coming to take his children uh, to live with him. I hope we will remember that and find ways to reach Samaritans in your area. So how are we going to do that? Identify and pray for Samaritans around you. Identify and pray for Muslims around you. Identify and pray for Hindus around you. Identify and pray for non-Christians around you. Now, obviously, you're not going to walk up to a person and say, uh, excuse me, sir, excuse me, madam, but would you consider yourself a, a Samaritan? No, we wouldn't do that. Uh, what I mean is to look around and, and see the people being rejected by our society, by other people. Look at the people who are different to us. Maybe it's a person in your high-rise building where you live. Maybe it's the street dweller. Maybe it's the poor person or the single mother or father who depends on social service uh, for funds to buy food and pay their rent. Maybe it's the unemployed who depend on the food bank to live. Maybe it's the less fortunate downtown that you gave a breakfast to sometime. Uh, maybe it's the student who dresses differently just to get uh, someone's attention. Maybe it's the youth at the shelter you help. Depending on your circle of influence, maybe it's the rich person who has no real friends, or maybe it's the geek with all the calculators and pencil protectors and computers and laptops and iPads uh, around him. Maybe it's just a short, skinny kid who just gets picked on at school, or maybe it's your Muslim friend who you live next door to, or you, who you work next door to, or who, 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 or walks the street uh, in the neighborhood uh, where you live. Find them and start praying for them. Pray that God would open their hearts to build a relationship with you. I want you to notice. Build a relationship with you. And then be willing as you build that relationship with them, they become willing to listen to that good news of who Jesus is. This is not enough, uh, a new principle. This is the method Jesus used. Uh, according to Ministry of Healings, page 143, uh, Jesus mingled with people as one who cared for them. And then he bid them, follow me, pray and mingle and reach out and build relationship with people. And as they build relationship with them, then you'll be able to share what Jesus has done for you, your own testimony, and then share from God's word, God's testimony to them. I pray that God would allow you the opportunity to share Jesus with that person or person, no matter how long it takes. Jesus came, friends, 
to seek and save that which was lost. He came to that which was his own and his own did not receive him, but he saved those who are lost. Pray for the opportunity to influence and impact Samaritans. Pray for the opportunity to influence and impact Muslims around you, in your neighborhood, on your workplaces, and wherever you find them, your, your taxi driver friend, or your, your bus driver friend, or your teacher friend, or, or your banker friend, or who is a Muslim who needs to hear about Jesus. Build that relationship with them so that one day you can give your testimony of who Jesus is to them and witness them from God's word of his goodness and his mercy. And as you as you do that, then you can welcome them into your fellowship. You know, there was a time, friends, when, when people came to church just because the doors of the church were open. Well, that just doesn't work anymore. People need to be invited to the church, and they need to see that the church has something to offer, not just in in way of a lively service, but in the way lives are changed by the word of God. And during these times, uh, uh, we need to be willing to invite people to your church. While you are not meeting within the confines of a church building, you're still having worship. Your church is still having worship. Invite them to meet with you online. As you build those relationships, you can invite them to uh, uh, enjoy a worship service which you are uh, uh, online as your church holds its service online. And, and as, as many of you are listening online, you can have them listening into and, and watching the videos and uh, whether it be on Zoom or YouTube or Facebook, whatever you're using, you can invite them in also. Let me ask you a question. What is the purpose of scripture? Well, I know you're thinking about it. And as you think about it, some of you would immediately say, uh, 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 well, uh, um, 2 Timothy 3.16 says it's about, about teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. And that's okay. That's fine. But these are just the means to the end. Mm -hmm. My dear brothers and sisters, the purpose of Scripture is to change lives. The Bible doesn't just exist to inform us about God. It exists to transform us to be godly, exhibit, exhibiting Christ-like behavior. And when people are being transformed by the word of God, it is easy to invite others and it is easy for people to see that we have something to offer but they need to be invited. So invited to come, not like you want them to be, but just as they are. Invited because they have developed a relationship with us. Don't try to get them all fixed up before you invite them. Invite them like they are to come to know who Jesus is. Remember where you were once and how Jesus took a hold of you and clean you up, then you need to invite them in to meet Jesus. And as you invite them, help them find opportunities to advance in their relationship. I'm speaking about spiritual mentorship here. So you have built a relationship with them. Uh, now you are inviting them. In fact, if we go back a bit, we prayed for them. Yes, we prayed for them. We we, we, we identified them as we prayed for them and we began a conversation like Jesus began the conversation with the woman at the, at the well and, and, uh, and then he spoke truth to her. We got to do the same. As we share with them in building that relationship, then we invite them in to a worship service. They, they accept Jesus Christ, but we got to walk with them in a spiritual mentorship program so that they can advance spiritually. You know, we are not very good at that, but we need to embrace that step in, in mentoring those who have come to Jesus so that they can grow spiritually. Jesus could have just left the woman at the well hanging. 
with the knowledge that he knew all about her sinfulness. Yes, he could have done that. But he went on to say that he was the Messiah. And then after the tongues people came to see this man, he stayed around a couple days and uh, some of them put their faith in him. He stayed around to help them advance spiritually. And as we look around to those who could use a hand up, spiritual hand up, we need to realize that it takes time and effort. And we must be willing as disciples of Jesus Christ to be able to help people up spiritually. Remember, Samaritans are people too. Muslims are people too who need to hear about God and what he has done for you, he can do for them. And in ministering to them, we need to set aside our prejudices. We need to speak truth in love and be ready and available to help. My dear friends, as we conclude, Jesus seemed to have had a special place in his heart for the Samaritans because in, he specifically mentions them in Acts 1.8 when Jesus mentions that the Holy Spirit will give the disciples power to be his witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And in Acts 8, the Bible records that Philip ends up with a revival in Samaria because God told him to visit the Ethiopian treasurer uh, in that place. God loves Samaritans. God loves Muslims. God loves everyone. And so should we, regardless of who they are, where they have come from, how they dress, what they eat, how they smell, we must be willing to love them like Jesus loved them. So what now, preacher? What are you going to do with this message uh, that the preacher has given to you. I'm going to ask you for a specific response here today. Uh, I want you to commit. Listen carefully as we conclude. I want you to commit to praying for and actively seeking to minister to at least one Muslim friend. I want you to take a few seconds and ask God to direct you to uh, a Muslim he wants you to minister to and ask him to put someone in your path to, to help them uh, to, to understand better the living word, the word that became flesh. Uh, ask him to, as you speak to God, ask him to, to share with you one person, just one, that uh, you want to see accept Jesus Christ. This is not easy, I know. Yes, it's not easy. But if the truth be told, God has all power to do anything he wants to do. And if we truly want to impact our communities for Christ, then we have to do our part. And we do that by being active in reaching out to those outside the family of God. I want to caution you that not everyone will respond as a Samaritan woman and the rest in her village. But we need to give it a try and trust God for the results. Trust him that just as his Holy Spirit was able to work on the heart of the Samaritan woman and the people of her village, that he would be working on the hearts of those who are yet to know Jesus Christ. And as you reach out to them, that your influence will help them to come into a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. And they too will declare that Jesus saves. God bless you as we pray. Father, we pray that you will be with us now. Help each of us that we would identify someone in our community who's yet to know Jesus Christ, especially those among our Muslim friends, that they will come to know who Jesus is and help us as we 
pray for that person that we'll set aside our prejudices that we have, that we will embrace that individual regardless of what they look like, and that we will be able to speak truth and love, that we will be able to spend time in helping them to grow spiritually as we build relationship with them, and then we will be able to point them to the living word as we invite them in and show them who Jesus is, that they can accept him before it is eternally too late. Bless us now, we pray. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you. Have a great Sabbath. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, pride and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful. Trusting, serving every day Just one glimpse of Him in glory Will the toil of life repay When we all, when we all get to heaven What a day of rejoicing that will be When we all, when we all see Jesus We'll sing and shout the victory Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty we'll behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. All right, uh, let us uh, bow our heads for prayer. Our most gracious and kind, loving Father, Lord, thank you again for your love for all of us. Thank you, Lord, for the message uh, that was delivered to us this morning. Lord, may it be that that message will have a uh, real impact uh, in our lives, uh, change our minds, change our hearts, uh, dear Father. Lord, uh, we'd like to ask for your continued blessing as we uh, uh, finish this worship that we have today. Uh, bless everyone that is uh, joining us in this worship. We ask all these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, um, I would like to thank uh, all of you for uh, attending our worship today. And uh, especially I would like to thank uh, Pastor Hazelwood for that powerful message uh, to all of us today. I would also like to thank um, Elder Sam Adriatico for uh, putting together our uh, uh, program for the Adventist Muslim Relations Sabbath. And also all our participants, uh, thank you. Uh, a reminder that uh, this afternoon, uh, for our elders, we have elders meeting at uh, 4 in the afternoon. So again, uh, thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, as usual, a special thanks to uh, Kiamani for our uh, worship uh, service live stream today. Uh, again, thank you and uh, take care. Happy Sabbath.